Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and Fusion Auth. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning. We have an exciting presentation ahead, but first, I have a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. First, today's session is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion, or you'd like to share it with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude the webinar today. If you have any questions for our speaker, you can submit those using the Q&A tab, which can be found on the right side of your screen. And if you have any just additional comments or want to let us know from where you're tuning in, I want you to direct those comments to the chat tab. We will have three polls throughout today's presentation, so we hope to have your participation there. And at the conclusion of our webinar, we will have a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So stick around to see if you're one of our winners. So on to our panel today, we'll be discussing how to secure your microservices architecture with JSON Web Tokens. And I'm joined today by Dan Moore, Head of Developer Relations at Fusion Auth. Dan, thank you so much for being here with us. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. I really appreciate the chance to talk with everyone. So today I'm going to talk about securing uh, your microservices architecture with JSON Web Tokens. In case you missed it, uh, I would love for this to be a conversation. So if you have questions, please do submit them using the Q&A tab. What I'm going to talk about today are a number of topics. We're going to talk about the challenges of auth in microservices. So kind of a brief, brief overview of how it differs from auth in a monolithic architecture. We'll talk about the basics of JSON Web Tokens or JWTs. We'll talk about how to validate a token to make sure that it is coming from who you expect it to be coming from and it contains information you expect it to contain. We'll talk about common microservices architectures that use JOTS or JSON Web Tokens. We'll talk briefly about revocation and what are some options around that. And then we'll talk about alternatives to JSON Web Tokens and some other things that may be worth investigating. And then finally, I'll end up with why I think you should use JSON Web Tokens in your microservices implement, uh, implementations. So let's talk briefly about the challenges of microservices from the context of auth. So the first thing is, you know, this is a typical monolithic app, very simple to do application, lets you write down to-dos and mark them as, as done. And in this application, we have one data store and one application code base. This may scale horizontally or may scale vertically, but at the end of the day, you have all your state in one place and all your code can interact with uh, other pieces of code, basically via memory or via that database. So sessions are a really great answer for auth in a monolithic system. Your user data is co-located with your application data and communication between components is synchronous and pretty darn good, right? When you're communicating via API calls, um, I'm sorry, when you're communicating via calling functions in the same JVM or the same runtime, things are pretty good about not failing. If you introduce microservices, it, you get a set of trade-offs. You get the ability to scale and deploy each of those microservices, the to-do, the share, the reminder functionality independently, and you can even write them in different languages, but coordination between them is more difficult. So you have different, possibly different data stores, communication between the components is, becomes more unreliable, becomes slower, requires marshaling on marshaling because you're not passing basically bits of memory or pointers to memory. Uh, instead, you're turning things into gRPC or JSON or some other kind of data format. And then the components can be written in different languages as well. But the honest truth is that it is, there's still one user, right? There's still one client that's coming in that wants to interact with your application. And so you need some way to represent that user to all of the components of your application. And that is what JSON Web Tokens or JOTS can help with. So let's cover kind of some brief parts about JSON Web Tokens. Uh, they are JSON. So they're basically a way of representing JSON um, in a way that's standardized and portable. It's actually pronounced JOT. So if you want to um, be in the know, you can pronounce them JOT. Uh, it is an IETF standard. 
so RFC 7519 is one of the main ones. There are three or four other ones that are clustered around that same time. It's been around for, I think, since 2015, so a number of years. But it's it's part of a standards body. They've reviewed it, and it should be relatively interoperable. JSON Web Tokens can be signed or encrypted, and this is a really important point. Signed JSON Web Tokens are by far more common and it, with a signed JSON Web Token, the payload is not is not um, hidden, right? So anyone who gets a hold of a JSON Web Token can view the payload. It's just base64 URL encoded JSON, and we'll see an example of that in, a, in further slides. Encrypted JSON Web Tokens, in contrast, actually encrypt the payload so that you have to have the key to be able to see it. So. I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna spend most of my time focusing on signed JSON web tokens because they're more common, but it is worthwhile to note two things. One is encrypted JOTs are an option. And if you use a signed JOT, you wanna make sure you're careful where you store it because anyone who gets a hold of it can look at the payload. You also wanna be careful what you put in the payload as well. So JOTs are often, um, used as stateless portable time-bound tokens of identity. So what does that mean? That's kind of a, a mouthful. Let me unpack that. So they're stateless in what I mean. By, and what I mean by that is that you can verify the validity of a JSON web token or a JOT without consulting any external system. So that means that they can scale well. That means that they are more resilient because they're self-encapsulated and self-contained. They're portable because even though they contain curly braces and double quotes and all that JSON goodness, they're encoded in such a way that they can be put into a lot of different transport mechanisms. You can put them in cookies, you can put them in HTTP headers, you can put them in a form parameter because they are URL safe. They're time bound because JOTs are good for a certain period of time. Uh, and you can decide on that time duration when you create them. And they're also used often as tokens of identity, which basically means that they contain information about a particular person or particular entity. These four different aspects mean that they're really great for APIs and microservices. They're also produced by a lot of different identity providers. So it's very common to have a JOT produced by some particular system and then be consumed by other systems that can rest assured that that JOT the information inside that JOT is valid for a certain period of time. It is about a certain thing, a certain entity, a person, or a piece of software. And they're not just supported by identity providers. They're also supported by a lot of other things, a lot of other components of the software ecosystem. There are a lot of client libraries out there. I have yet to run into a major language that didn't support JOTs and encoding and decoding and signing and verifying of JOTs. Uh, there's a lot of articles and documentation out there. So when you choose JOT as part of your auth, so JOTs as part of your auth solution, you're basically buying into this widely supported standardized ecosystem. So here is our application again. And we are going to kind of walk through a step of uh, a process where you're gonna get some to-dos. So you have a JSON web token or the client has one and it presents it to the API gateway. But where does it get that JSON web token from? Well, it gets it from an identity provider typically. And I am not going to spend a lot of time talking about identity providers. There's a lot of documentation out there. There are other talks I've given about this process. Let's just assume it's kind of a black box. The client magically somehow gets a JSON web token. So we'll step, step uh, through the process in more detail of what happens after they get that JSON Web Token in a few slides. I did want to mention a couple of benefits of using a JSON Web Token that you have flexibility around your signature. So the signature is the thing that allows you to trust that this JOT, the content of this JOT was not changed at any time since the signer created it. But you, can, you have a couple of options. You can do it with a symmetric key. You can do it with a public-private key pair and different algorithms within those families as well. The big win or a big win for using JOTs is that you can validate 
the JSON Web Token at the API gateway in your microservices system without ever communicating with the JWT issuer. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a little bit. And then because a JWT is JSON, you can put other things in this object. And so it doesn't just have to be kind of a binary yes or no decision like it might be with something like an API key. You actually can put in roles, um, other metadata that might be business domain specific. If we're talking about a to-do app, it might be something like the level of um, subscription that the user has, right? They might have a premium subscription or a lower tier subscription. So here is a jot. So this is a signed JSON web token and every signed JSON web token has three components. There is a green header, a blue payload and a tan uh, signature. So the header and the payload are just base64 URL encoded text. So you can actually, if you want to, you can cut and paste that string and put it into a base64 decoder online or on your command line. And the header contains metadata about the jot. So that's what algorithm was signed with and other useful metadata. The body is where things get really interesting. And this is also called the payload. There's two pieces of information I want you to take out of this this uh, this slide. The first is that the the keys of the JSON object are called claims, and that's just kind of a fancy word, but you'll see that kind of bandied about whenever you read about JSON web tokens. And the second is that the claim the the values of the claims don't have to be just primitives. So you can see that the ISS claim is a string, the EXP claim is a number but the roles claim is an array. And so you can actually put lots of different information into a JSON web token to, uh, to help your microservices determine what, what functionality they should expose to this particular request. It doesn't have to just be primitives. We'll talk a little bit later about some of these other claims in more detail. The signature is, a, as I've mentioned before, is a really important part of JOTS. That is what allows you to verify, as a consumer of a JSON web token, that's, that is what allows you to verify that things haven't changed over the wire or by some sinister malicious actor. And I'm not going to dig too deep into how a signature is created, but it's useful to have some high-level understanding. Basically, what you do as a creator of a JSON web token is you take the header and the payload and you concatenate them together and then you run through a cryptographic operation with a secret or a key. And then you get a back a binary string and you URL encode that, or base64 URL encode it. And then you append that to the JOT. And then you send that off. And when it lands at the consumer, you want to basically do the same thing, right? You take the header, you take the payload, you run through a cryptographic operation, and perhaps uh, with a public key, if it's an asymmetric operation, or, or uh, the secret, if it's a symmetric operation, and you validate that signature. And so, uh, again, that is kind of the first step you should always take whenever you're processing a JOT. And the signature being there is what gives us the guarantees that lets us not go back to the central server, right, to the identity provider and say, hey, is this JOT valid? So that brings us to our first poll. Cody, can you bring that up, please? So what is not a benefit of using a signed JOT? So I've given you some benefits of using a signed JOT. I mentioned that they're the most common. What is not a benefit? And you go ahead and go ahead and pick one of the four options there. I'm not going to read them all to you. I know you all can give them a gander. But what is not a benefit of using a signed JSON web token? And we'll be up for 30, 30 seconds or 45 seconds. And please weigh in. I feel like we should have some hold music or something going on here. 
All right. So we have two answers that are in front. Uh, the first is the contents of the jar are not visible to anyone who doesn't have the decryption key. And the second is you can encode business specific logic in the token. And I guess that answer, so the, the correct answer, the one that I was thinking of was the contents of the JOT are not visible because with a signed token, the contents of the JOT are visible because you can just URL decode it or base 64 decode it. I think that you all, the audience had a really good point about the business specific logic because it depends on how you define logic. There's definitely business specific data you can put into a signed JSON Web token, but you definitely can't execute things in it. So thank you. All right, let's kind of skip on to signing algorithms. So there's two main families supported. There's symmetric with a shared secret, and then there's asymmetric, which is where you use a private key to sign the JOT and a public key to verify it. And typically you, you as a as a microservices uh, creator are should really expect an asymmetric algorithm, right? Uh, you can define this at the identity provider. Fusion Auth, for example, supports multiple different kinds, but typically you're gonna use an asymmetric algorithm at the API gateway. And there's a couple of reasons for it. If you don't have a shared secret, that makes deployment a lot easier because every time, if you do have a shared secret, every time you do a deploy or you want to rotate that secret, you need to change every AP, every everything that is expecting that JSON web token because it needs to get the new secret. And that may work fine for a to-do API or to-do application that has one API gateway and, and one identity provider. But if you start to have multiple API gateways or a lot of different APIs that are all expecting to be able to verify a JSON web token, you're going to quickly run into kind of an operational issue. But the bigger issue is security. So when you have a shared secret, the thing that is verifying the JSON web token, because it has access to that shared secret, it knows the cryptographic algorithm, it has everything that it needs to create a JSON web token that is indistinguishable from the things that are used to verify the JSON, oh, sorry, that is indistinguishable from that that's created by the identity provider. So that means that you need to secure your API gateway or any other consumer of a JSON web token very carefully. And if you instead use an asymmetric algorithm, well, the public key is public. So everything should be able to have a public key. I mean, everything should be able to see the public key and you can spend instead spend your time securing the identity provider, which actually holds the private key. However, there's no such thing as a free lunch. The asymmetric algorithm option tends to be a little bit more complicated to understand, and it is a little bit slower. You should always benchmark rather than trust what someone tells you, but because it, it, every everything is uh, situational, but in my benchmarking, I've seen it be between two and 10 times slower to sign or verify a jot with an asymmetric algorithm depending on the algorithm, the size of the JSON web token, and whether you're signing or verifying. So how does this kind of work in practice with an asymmetric key? Well, the identity provider, again, generates the JOT. So it signs the JOT with a private key. And then the API gateway needs the RSA or whatever other algorithm they're using, the public key. There are a couple of ways for the API gateway to get that public key. The first is it can just be deployed with the API gateway. So the API gateway can have, you know, one or more public keys that it knows about. And when the JOT comes in, the JOT basically as part of that metadata says, hey, I, I was signed with this key and the API gateway can look up the public key from its file system or other data storage system. Another more common option is for the API gateway to periodically call out to a well-known endpoint and this is another standard, I think it's RFC 7517. And the this well-known endpoint has a list of public keys that are available via uh, a URL. And that looks a little bit like this. This is pretty busy. So I'm not gonna kind of skip over this and just show you the parts that are really relevant. Here is an example of a public key. We have an algorithm, we have a key identifier, and that's crucial because that is what tells the API gateway which public key to use. That, that is also included in the JSON web token. 
And then the X5C uh, key actually just points to a chain of public keys. So you can you can chain public keys if you want to like do a search chain. The validation step is going to involve a signature and is going to involve that public key. Um, what we want to really prevent in a microservice architecture is a, a bad jot that is malformed or expired or otherwise invalid from getting through to a microservices. So the API gateway can receive it because it's presented by the client, but it's not going to pass it through to the uh, microservices, no matter what the request is. So basically, just like the API gateway is handling throttling or load balancing or the other things that are really great with an API gateway, it's also handling that auth function, right? Making sure the user is authenticated, making sure the user is authorized. So the first thing that API gateway needs to do is validate the signature. And again, here is our public key. And we have that key identifier that starts with UK0. That's the KID right up here. And the, the dot that comes in also has a key identifier. And so the API gateway can match up those key identifiers and then pull the right public key to, to do the validation. If the signature is not valid, you want to stop. And whether you're building your own API gateway or whether you're using a commercial system, you always want to make sure the signature checks out. And that includes uh, the algorithm and the, the, the signing process. But Typically, you're not going to be rolling this yourself. You're going to be using a library. There's a ton of open source libraries out there. I have looked at a couple of different API gateways, right? Amazon's API gateway. I know Kong supports it. So definitely use the built-in functionality that uh, will do this signature validation for you. You're going to be a lot happier if you, if you can leverage that. The next thing, however, is not something that an API gateway can necessarily do for you. You might need to write custom code for that. Um, or you might need to write a plugin, or there are some, some of these are supported by some of the API gateways, but this is really um, something you're going to have to kind of configure or set up if you don't have to write custom code for it. So, the, and this is validating the claims of the JSON web token. So, here's our payload again, and we have our uh, various claims. Some of these are standardized that are defined in that RFC that I mentioned way back when, 7519, and others are not. But the standardized ones are ones that you should absolutely check. And the three that you definitely want to check are the issuer claim. So that's ISS. And this could be a domain name. It could be a URL. It could be a UUID. It's not defined what the value of it is, what, but the semantic meaning of it is what entity created this JSON web token. And you obviously don't want to be consuming a JSON web token if you don't know who created it or you don't or who you created it or what created it isn't what you expect. So this needs to be something that is mashed up between the identity provider or whatever is creating the JOT and the API gateway. The next is the X claim, which stands for expiration. And this is the number of seconds since 1970 uh, in UTC time, after which this jot is no longer valid. I mentioned that jots are time bound by their nature, and that's the flip side of them being stateless. So they're only good for a certain period of time. So if you see a jot that is expired, you should not proceed any further. It, it's just not a valid JSON web token. The last claim that you should really check out is the audience claim. And again, this doesn't have a defined value. It could be a UUID like it is here or something else. But this is who the JOT is for. And so in the case that we're looking at, this is the to-do app, basically. And this audience claim doesn't have to be just one. It could be an array of identifiers. But it's really important to check this. And you can imagine that um, you might have you know, multiple different microservices in your architecture or multiple different applications. And there might be an application that's a to-do app, and there might be an application that's a uh, billing app. right? And the admin role means different things in the billing app 
gives you access to different functionality in the billing app than it does in the to-do app. And what you don't want to have happen is have someone get a valid jot that has um, in that it, that is valid in the to-do app that has a role of admin and then take that around and present that to the billing app and then have the billing app treat that as an admin user in the billing app. So in this case, you know, that is at best a bug at worst, like a, a severe escalation privilege. So definitely always check the odd claim. If the claims are invalid or they're not what you expect, then you want to stop again, stop processing. Don't pass it through to the microservices. Otherwise, you can now start to pass things through to the microservices. So the big two things that you want to do are check the signature and then check the claims are as expected. There's one other important claim that, that is standardized that you probably want to know about, which is the sub claim. And again, the actual value of this is not defined in the spec, but the meaning of the sub claim is who is this jot about? So ISS is who created the jot. Odd is who is this jot for? And sub is who is this jot about? It's also called the principal in some uh, literature. So we're on to our second poll. So Cody, can you bring that up, please? So when validating a JOT and API gateway, what should you do? Which of these steps should you take? And again, we'll take about a minute. So Dan, I'll note that we do have a fair amount of responses. It is just an overwhelming majority of D, all of the above. All right, then we'll take it. That is correct. You need to check the signature. You need to make sure the expiration claim is correct and check the audience claim. All these are really important steps to take to make sure that a jot is valid. So good work, everyone. All right. Let's kind of jump into common auth architectures that we see with microservices. And that we've seen this with uh, a number of our clients. So the first thing, and I know as soon as someone says zero trust, sometimes engineers I know roll their eyes, right? It's, it's kind of a marketing term, but JOTs and using JOTs in your system really do allow you to implement zero trust because you can make sure that all the calls have some form of authorization embedded in them. And so you don't need to have any kind of trust in your, you know, perimeter. You can actually uh, implement a zero trust solution with uh, JOTS. So what we have here is a call that the client has a JSON web token. They present it to the API gateway and they're calling to get the to do's for this given user. And again, remember the users authenticated some other way via the identity provider and the identity provider has given them that JSON web token. So what are some ways that we can make sure that the to-do uh, microservice has all the information it needs to deliver the, um, deliver the to-dos for the given user, but also is doing so in a secure manner? Well, the first is pretty straightforward. It's basically a pass-through of the JOT. So in this case, we have the JOT lives at the client. It gets passed to the API gateway as a header or as a cookie or in some other manner. Gets uh, The API gateway directs the traffic to the to-do microservice. Then the to-do microservice receives the JOT. And then the to-do microservice can extract the JOT, um, extract things like the subject claim or the roles that might be important claims for it to look at. And it can also validate the JOT separately. So this is a, an approach that I definitely talk to clients who are using. Um, the benefits are that the API gateway is super simple, right? The API gateway does a little bit of validation. Um, there's also benefit in that the auth logic 
in terms of which claims are important to which microservice, that's all pushed into the microservices. However, the microservices still ha now have to use JSON Web Tokens and they have to know about that. And they have to know about validating JSON Web Tokens. And conceivably, they have to have access to that public key if the JOT that was passed in was signed with a public key, which it probably was, then the to-do API needs access to that public key somehow. So that's the pass-through approach. The, another option is to pass a subset of claims. And so in this case, the JOT is presented to the API gateway. The API gateway parses that JOT, pulls out the things that it knows the to-do microservice needs, sticks them into the header or the body of the request, and passes it to the to-do uh, microservice, as well as, and it doesn't just pass just that body, it also appends an API key. And the reason why that API key is really important is because the to-do app needs to know that this request came from the API gateway. Again, kind of thinking about zero trust. So the to-do app then gets that information, right? And can, it can validate the API key and it can look at the, it can extract out the parameters that it knows it needs to get the to-dos. So the benefit of this is the microservices are simpler, right? They don't have to know anything about JSON web tokens. The auth payload can be much smaller because you're just pulling off just the things that to-do uh, microservice needs. But the trade-off is the API gateway gets more complicated. It now needs to have some logic to know, okay, I'm passing something to the to-dos uh, microservice, it needs such and such claim. Oh, I'm passing something to the reminder microservice, it needs a different claim. And you're also pushing business logic, what I would consider to be business or auth logic, up to the API gateway. A third option that we've seen our clients use is what I call the reissue pattern. And so in this case, we have a JOT and it's signed by an asymmetric key. The API gateway examines it, does all those validation steps we talked about, and then it reissues a new key, a new JOT, excuse me. And so that new JOT can have different properties. It can have different claims. It can have different uh, expiration time. It can be signed with a different key. The two API, uh, the two microservice, excuse me, can basically ingest that JOT and pull out the information it needs and then return the to-dos back to the client. So this is an interesting kind of hybrid approach because the microservices can still leverage JOT, JOTs, but you don't have to necessarily have that access to that public key because you can actually use a symmetric signing key for that new JOT. And the reason why you might choose a symmetric signing key is because the strengths of the asymmetric key, and the asymmetric approach are you don't have to worry about coordination across departments and you're not worried as worried about security, but here you're all within, or sorry, yeah, you're not as worried about security, but here we're all within kind of one context, right? Like we trust each other behind the API gateway probably a lot more than we trust random clients or possibly other departments that are, or other pieces of software that are producing a JSON web token. So we're behind kind of a security gateway or sorry, we're in a secure enclave, but we're not totally trusting. We're still gonna check the JOT and we can still check the signature, but it's a lot easier to rotate a key across four different services than it is across um, services that span departments. Uh, you can also make the lifetime very, very short and you can essentially make this JOT one-time use. You could have the lifetime be two seconds or five seconds. And that means if any malicious actor is on your network and somehow gets a chance to steal the JOT, well, it's not good for very much because it's not good for very long. Now, again, the API gateway logic is more complicated and that business logic, uh, especially if you're rewriting claims, is embedded in the API gateway. But you can get you know, kind of a hybrid approach here. You could keep the same claims, but just change the algorithm, change the lifetime, and that might make things simpler. So, you know, I figured you all are thinking, well, which is best? And the short answer is I'm going to reach back to my consulting background. It really depends. It depends on what you're looking to do. Uh, if you just want to get started, then the pass through is going to be probably the simplest to implement and require the least kind of custom code. Um, 
And then it depends on whether you want to really push a bunch of logic up into your API gateway and how much JWT processing code you want in your microservices. There is a special case here of microservice to microservices requests. So all of the previous architectures were really dependent on a client kicking them off, right? The client makes the call, the client presents the JOT, and then the JOT is, is processed in your microservice uh, architecture. Um, but if you're doing microservices and microservices, then you're going to want to reach for a different situation where the microservice is the thing that's being authenticated, not the client from outside. And this is the client credentials grant. And so here we might have a reminder service or microservice that wants to access the to-dos. And it might want to do that because you might want to just do a, a daily reminder. So every morning at seven o'clock in the morning, the reminder service is going to reach out to the to-dos, find all of the to-dos that have a due date of today and send a message saying, uh, you know, via push notification or email or SMS or whatever, saying, hey, you have a to-do today. But there's no user driving this. It's just a, a cron job or, or a scheduled job. But we don't want the to-do API to rely on the fact that the call is coming from inside the microservices network boundary. We want to actually make sure that we authenticate it. So how can we do this? Well, the reminder service, microservice, can reach out to an internal, internal identity provider and authenticate itself. And then that identity provider can provide a JOT, which can then be presented to the to-do app, the to-do API. And that to-do microservice can do all the things it would do with a JOT that was presented in any other way. And it can rest assured that this was a properly authorized request. That brings us to our third and final poll. What, so when you're thinking about a microservices auth architecture, what would you not be concerned about of these four options? And again, just the things, just from the API gateway back, like what are you thinking about in terms of picking one of those three or four architectures that we've talked about? Got two horses in the race. Well, maybe three or four. All right. Um, I think we should call it Cody. Uh, that is the correct answer. How the client should store the token. How the client stores the token is really important for JOT based systems, but it's not important for the microservices auth architecture itself. You just assume the client is gonna present it to the, is gonna securely store it and is gonna present it to the API gateway. All right, uh, we're kinda heading down the, the, the home stretch. This is a question we get a lot whenever you're talking about JSON web tokens. Can you revoke a, a JOT that the client has? And the answer is sort of. There's a couple of different options and they're all trade-offs because they all introduce state back into the system, right? One of the strengths of JSON Web Tokens is that it is stateless, that it is possible to validate it without talking to any external server. That means that if you want to invalidate it, you need to have, you need to reintroduce that state. Otherwise, you couldn't possibly invalidate something. Um, so one option is to just have a really short lifetime. And that may involve using that reissue pattern, or it may involve you saying, hey, we're gonna have our JOTs be good for two minutes and we're gonna threat model it out and determine that the issue of someone stealing it, you know, someone logging out, someone stealing that JOT, a malicious actor stealing that JOT, and then having two minutes to execute things on it is gonna, it, that's a small enough probability and our risk is low enough that we can accept that. That's one option. Uh, you can also use revocation with an identity provider if they support it. 
And how that works is someone logs out, uh, the API gateway sends a revoke request to the identity provider. And then um, that jot is now revoked. But the unfortunate thing is that means that every time the API gateway gets a jot, it needs to check with the identity provider. And it needs to do that whether or not it's revoked it or not, which basically, again, takes away from the stateless nature of jots. And I'm presenting you with architectural options. Uh, this seems like I'm not sure I would head down this path unless you had certain very specific requirements because you're basically losing out on a tremendous benefit of jots. Another option is to rotate the key. And so basically what you're doing is you are removing the um, key from the JWKS or wherever else you place the key that the API gateway is going to use to check the uh, validity of the jot. And if you remove that key, and a, and a jot comes in with a key identifier of UK zero, well, it's not gonna find that key in that signature, therefore it will definitely be invalid. Another option is to use what we call the deny list option. And so in this case, when you log out on the client, you're gonna log out from the identity provider, which can then fire a webhook to the API gateway and any other interested parties. And those interested parties can keep a table of revoked jots just with an identifier or um, some other um, way of knowing which jot was applicable to which user. Then the API gateway will, whenever it gets a new, uh, whenever it get, sees a jot, in addition to checking the signature and checking the issuer claim and the audience claim and the expiration time, it will also check against this data store and say, oh, was this jot revoked? And that can be a really nice scalable way to do things. Real quick, talk about some alternatives to JOTS. Uh, you can use API keys to kind of control access between your microservices. Issues that they, they have are they're static unless you build in like a rotation period. They're not necessarily time bound, again, unless you build that in. So you can get some of the same benefits from JOTS if you build it. <laughs> so then you have to build that. Um, one thing that API keys can't have is the ability to encode additional metadata because they don't have that payload necessarily. Uh, so they're just a string and, and they can basically say yes or no, but they can't give you the gradations of permissions or authorization level. Another option is to use a proprietary solution. I know AWS has built their own API key format and I think they published some things about it and that is time bound. It's actually bound to time, region and, and service as well. So this is kind of my final pitch. We're coming up on the end. So I think you should use JOTS for microservices off because they're scalable. And by scalable, I mean that you can push the JOT to the client and then the client can present it to one or more API gateways and never has to communicate with the identity provider. So you end up kind of with a shared nothing architecture and the API gateway has minimal interaction with that identity provider, right? And how much interaction it has depends on how you're doing revocation, how you're distributing the public keys, but you can choose how little interaction you want. And you can have it be zero actually. If you distribute the public keys and you don't use revocation, then they don't need, it doesn't even, the API gateway doesn't even need to have network access to the identity provider. So you can set things up that way if you want. Another thing about JOT-based architectures is that they're resilient. If the identity provider is going up and down a little bit, it doesn't affect the API gateway because it can validate that JOT is a, an acceptable JOT without ever communicating with the identity provider. And so obviously if the identity provider goes down for 10 days or even two hours, when JOTs start to expire, you're going to be affected. But if it's small blips of uptime or downtime, it's not going to affect your system. And that built-in statelessness and that built-in redundancy is helpful for building out distributed systems. It's also secure. Um, the API gateway can check that JSON web token without, again, and, and because of cryptography and the cryptographic properties of JSON web tokens, it can know you can absolutely know that that jot was created by the identity provider that possessed that secret. And then it can, 
as we talked about in the, the architecture section, peel off bits and pieces and create a new jot. And that new jot can be used to pa uh, pass values to the each of the microservices. And then the, those microservices can know that the jot was created by the API gateway. There's another benefit, which I think is understated. I think that as engineers, we often feel like we can kind of do things better. And I will say that having watched the standards process and read up on the standards process about how JOTS and other standards around them were created, there's just some people out there that spend a lot of time thinking about this. And by using a standard like JSON Web Tokens, you get all of the time and attention that those people have spent uh, thinking about edge cases, um, doing security threat modeling, having the review in the open and you get all those benefits for essentially free i guess that's not totally free because you have some constraints when you use jots but um there's just a ton of people out there thinking about the security properties of this problem in a way that um and and people that more people than that you could probably afford to hire at your company so that is the end of my presentation i'm sorry i'm one minute over but if you want the slides or you want to contact us to learn more about FusionAuth or Jots or microservices and how we see them implemented, please feel free to reach out. There's our email address and there's our website if you'd like to learn more. I think now we'll head over to Q&A. Awesome, Dan. So we did receive quite a few questions during today's seminar. So it looks like we've got a lot of people who are interested. Great. Uh, our first question reads, any recommendations for asymmetric signing algorithm considering performance and security? That's another one of those it depends questions, right? So uh, you have a couple of different families. Um, you have RSA, you have elliptic curve cryptography. I think there's one more out there. And then you tend to have longer, uh, you tend to have, I think, 2048, 30, whatever the 3000 one is, and then 4096 in terms of bit length um of the key and i think that the the short answer is i think you just need to benchmark it right and i will say that i suspect that the signing unless you're perhaps a high frequency trader i suspect that the signing algorithm that you choose um is not going to be kind of the key performance indicator of your your system i suspect that pulling things from the database or other processing you do behind behind the microservices or behind the API gateway will be um, more uh, dominant. But it's hard to give general advice other than make it as big as you can do and have it not be uh, and avoid your performance issues. Sorry. All right, we'll move on to our next question. And it reads, generally speaking, is it okay to use the claims like roles inside our microservices to perform authorization? Uh, yes, I would say it. Um, in general, that is a fine use. I think that one pattern we've seen some companies uh, approach is is just to use plain old roles and. You, it, that's basically just becomes a contract, right? Like if your microservices are expecting them, then if the identity provider changes the role names or anything like that, things are going to break. So that's one more thing that you could have the API gateway check to make sure that the roles are, you know, within a set of a hundred roles or whatever the standardized roles are. Um, another thing you can do if you need more fine grained access is you can actually have what we've seen, um, what I've seen called uh, an authorization server where you present the roles and the resource that's being requested and possibly the date and time and other metadata to an authorization server and the authorization server ingests that all and gives you kind of a thumbs up or thumbs down. But I would save that until you need it. We've seen plenty of people be successful just with roles that are strings that their microservices um, basically validate and then consume. So when using service-to-service -service communication through events, do you recommend the JOT be passed, passed or forwarded as part of the event or command? Um, yeah, I mean, if you're, if, you're lever if you're leveraging JOTs to be part of your authorization infrastructure, then it absolutely needs to be passed on. 
uh, you're gonna things you're gonna want to think about there is the duration of the jot. Again, event-based systems, the ones I've seen tend to process events pretty quickly, but sometimes they don't. And so you're gonna want to have some exp you you're not gonna want to make the expiration time too big. So you're gonna want to have some way to maybe refresh the jot if you're processing those events not close to the time that they were generated. Um, the other thing to think about is um, um nope that was that was all i had about that sorry i had another thought and i it escapes me all righty uh so we'll move on to this next question that reads um what are recommended ttl for jots as short as you can stomach so uh, again this is another one of those it depends questions uh we tend to see on the order of seconds or minutes you certainly don't want a jot to be good for a day because, again, anyone who finds that jot can now pass it around. And because that jot is self-contained and it contains authorization and authentication information, they are present be able to, a malicious actor who finds a jot can present themselves as you. Um, I like to think of jots kind of like car keys, right? If I hand my friend a car, my car key he or she can get in my car and turn the car on and get access to all that car's functionality, right? Like whether that's um, being able to drive places or listen to my sweet, sweet radio stations. It doesn't matter what it is. The key gives access. Well, jots are, this, are very similar to the same way. There are some standards that actually bind a jot to a client, but those are pretty poorly deployed. So in general, JOTS uses bearer tokens. So you want it to be very, very, you want it to be as short as possible that will still meet your needs, right? Like don't make it a second if that means that the JOT will never be valid because it takes longer than a second to get through your microservices system. For PSK signing, is it best to have one secret per service or per department? And um, would it allow... Uh, to remind services to craft a jot to walk to, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm misreading this question. So I'll just start with the first part. For PSK signing, is it best to have one secret per service or per department? Yeah, so you're basically asking in here, is it best to have one secret per each of these to treat them as Maybe I'm missing the point of your question, but I think you're asking, should I treat these as separate audiences or should I treat them as one audience that is, um, you know, has three kind of sub three piece of functionality. Um, and I guess the answer there would be, it depends on who owns this stuff, right? So if you have one team that owns all of this, then I think it's probably best to have one secret. Right, if they're deploying them together and they're just breaking them out as microservices for, um, you know, clarity, or because eventually they're planning to grow them out, uh, but um, that's probably the way I would cleave that. Whereas if the to do was owned by a different team than the share, then they're probably different audiences, and they could conceivably have you know different roles that mean different things. That's probably the way I'd answer that. It's a good question, though. It is really, you know, you're getting to the heart of like how you design the system. And um, I'm always a fan of, of starting simpler and then bringing in more complexity as you have to. So uh, are there size limits for the payload? Yeah, that's a good question. So the answer is no, not within the JWT specification. However, JOTs aren't just like magically created and, um, you know, never transported. So there are limits in terms of the transport. So, you know, cookies have a maximum size if you're storing them as cookies. Headers have a maximum size depending on the browser. And so uh, you need, or, or the client, I should say, not necessarily, it's not always going to be a browser. So that is the fundamental limit. And then I will say that I just did some recent benchmarking and it does impact again, depending on the, the algorithm and the, the operation, 
the larger the um, payload, the, the longer the signing took. And, I, and it wasn't too bad. I think I saw an increase. If I made the payload 10 times the size of, you know, Jot 1 had a payload of X and Jot 2 had a payload of 10X, I think it took between uh, 20% to 100% more time to sign it. So it doesn't scale linearly for sure. But um, it does impact that. So two things to think about are where you're storing the jots and what limits are on that. And then what is, what's the performance impact of signing and verifying a larger jot? All right, so I've got, um, we'll go ahead and do one more question and then we'll end with an audience comment before I give you the floor back. The first question is, do you have any good book recommendations for microservices architecture? That's a great question. I don't have anything off the top of my head. Um, so I, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. Well, then we'll follow up with, um, are your benchmark tests public? They are indeed. You can go to fusionauth.io and we have a, a large number of vendor agnostic articles. We call them expert advice. And there's a whole section called tokens. So that would include some signing benchmarks. And actually, the code is available. And if you send a request to sales at FusionAuth, um, they'll pass it on to me and I can get you that code. It, it's in Ruby, right? So don't focus on the absolute numbers. Focus on the relative things. And then you could use those as a model for benchmarking the jots in whatever language you use. Awesome. And so I'll, uh, I'm going to give you this comment that somebody sent in to our comment section and um, I'll, I'll let you respond to that as well as um, let you leave us with any closing remarks that you might have. Um, so Mustafa says, I guess the security issue with JOTS is not in the standard or concept, but in how it's implemented and validated for a specific use case. What are your thoughts on that? Mustafa, that's a great comment. I think that you could replace jots in that sentence with pretty much any technology, right? Technology is a tool. There are definitely sharp parts of jots. And I have a, another presentation where I talk about like some foot guns that you can avoid, but jots are absolutely used every day to build really secure, solid systems. And like any other tool, you just need to make sure you understand the, the general parameters and, and use it well. But that's a that's a very um, that's a great way to end it because jots are a great tool, but like any great tool, you can use them to do dumb things. Well, perfect. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, so is there anything that you'd like to leave our audience with before we start wrapping things up? Yeah, I would just like to say uh, thank thank you all for your time. I really appreciate you coming along on this journey with me. I hope that I helped illuminate why JOTS are a good fit for microservices architectures and some of the things you need to do to, as Mustafa mentioned, implement them safely and securely so that you can uh, not just um, build a microservices architecture that's performant, but build one that is has layers of security all the way through and is scalable and resilient. So. Again, really appreciate your time. And if you have any further questions, you know where to where to find me. Yes, the contact for um, for Dan is sales at fusionauth.io. It's both on the screen and in the top of the chat if you want to go ahead and copy that down real quick. Um, so Dan, thank you so much for being here with me for putting together this presentation and um, I mean, filling 60 minutes with with nothing but information. So we, we really appreciate you taking the time to to put this together for us. Thank you so much for having me, Cody. And thank you all again for your attention and, and your poll voting and your questions. Awesome. I would quickly like to remind our audience today that the session was recorded. So if you missed any of our discussion or you'd just like to rewatch it, um, a link to access the on-demand will be emailed to you shortly after we conclude today's webinar. Um, quickly, we do have some gift cards to give away. So our first winner of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing is Ankit J. Our second winner is Louise L. Our third winner is Surin K. 
And our fourth winner is Ariel J. So congratulations to the four of you. Please keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. And if you don't see an email, just check your spam folder. I would like to also extend our gratitude to Fusion Auth for sponsoring today's webinar. And my final thanks goes to you, our audience. We really appreciate you being here with us today. Please take a moment to fill out our post-webinar survey, and we really hope to see you at a future TechStrong Learning webinar.